Well, hello, Lori. Welcome to the show this week. It's so great to meet you and have you here today. Why don't you just start by telling us uh, your cancer story? Oh, well, first and foremost, thank you so much for having me here today. It's truly an honor. Um, my cancer story is very different than most. Um, I was 40, just about to turn 41. I was in the best shape of my life. I was working out five to six days a week, eating everything I needed to eat, you know, the right way, sometimes indulging in stuff I shouldn't. But for the most part, I was very conscious of my health. And I, I've been a pathologist assistant for 20 years. So my background is working in oncology. It's something that I know. I've worked both in the laboratory side and the patient care side. Um, so it's something I'm very, very familiar with. And I um, had gone to my PCP at 40. She's like, make sure you get yourself a mammogram. You need a baseline. That year came and went. When I went back to my PCP when I was closer to 41, she's like, Lore, she's like, um, you know, I went in there apologizing. And I'm like, I am so sorry, but I never made it to my exam. And, and um, she's like, you know what, Lore, don't worry about it. They just changed the guidelines to 40 five, you just bought yourself another four years. And having that, I, you know, I've been in the field for so long that I was kind of like taken back a bit. Like, I'm, I'm like, I didn't hear that. Um, but I sat with it a little bit. And about two weeks later, I woke up from this awful dream that I was riddled with cancer head to toe. So the first thing I did, I got on the phone with my friend and I'm like, I am scared. I don't know what's going on, but you know what? I probably should go get that mammogram. And I called, you know, and I told my friend, can you please make sure that I don't list out this time? Like, I really need to make the time to go. So we ended up, um, I ended up putting a call in. They had an appointment the very next day, which as most of us who work in healthcare know or have tried to get an appointment, like that never happens. So I went the next day, they called me back for a second screen. And I wasn't too concerned because it's typical that happens. Um, and when I went back for the second screen, they repeated my mammogram with um, enhancement. <laughs> and then they ended up doing an ultrasound. And I was probably on the table for a good hour and a half. And I was at image number 65 before I finally like had the realization that I'm like, okay, it's more than just a repeat screen, just in case. Um, and I knew it because they were measuring my lymph nodes. Now, every day of my life at work, I would look at radiographs, I would look at ultrasound imaging, because what we would do is, I'm the person that when patients would get a lumpectomy, a mastectomy, or even a biopsy, I would physically get the tissue. So I was responsible for diagnosing the patient that I was working on. So when I was kind of on the other side of the table, and they're looking at my lymph nodes, I was like automatically like, oh my God, <laughs> right? And I, I make a joke about it because you know how they have those um, colorful lights above the bed? As a practitioner, I never yes. really understood it. I'm like, why do they have that? Like, it's so weird. It's, wouldn't they put something nicer? And then being a patient on the table, that's all I had to look at. Um, it actually helped me, you know, be distracted from what was going on. And, and it was like that moment where I'm like, okay, one, I understand why that light is there. Two, this is what I'm going to be doing with the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. Three, this is, I'm writing my will, right? Like that's yeah. literally the thought that was going through my mind because I knew what was happening, even though nobody had yet to say, hey, by the way, you know, you have cancer. What a unique experience given your education and your experience mm -hmm. in working with patients, maybe on a daily basis going mm -hmm. through this. Um, but what was that true effect of your experience? Did it affect the way you, you know, you hit the ground running, I would, I would imagine with your knowledge, but how did, was that a good thing for you to know as much as you know, or is it really kind of, was that a hard thing to know as much as you know? It, it's a blessing and a curse. It's a blessing because I'm the person for the people in my life. If anybody has a problem, whether it's cancer or if it's just a chronic illness or they stub their toe, right? Like I'm the one that walks them through, like, this is what you need to do first. This is what you need to do second. And I keep them calm. So when it's now my turn to keep myself calm and I know more than I probably should know, right? Because right. in my mind, I automatically went, okay, this could go two ways. I could uh, either be absolutely fine or I could end up with metastatic, you know, cancer to my brain, to my bones and 
and I, in that moment, it, everything was just, I was acutely aware of all of it. So it was difficult for me because I never had the opportunity to be naive. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Yeah. In, in that, uh, the innocence of not really understanding how serious this really could be. Exactly. Yeah, you, you weren't given that, that luxury. Right. Uh, and, yeah. And, and that's how I describe this whole process is that you really lose your innocence, right? right? Regardless of how much you know and how much medical background you have, you can never go back to how your life once was once you're diagnosed. Yeah, but I think that brings up another point that I wanted to make and have you sort of talk about is that in your work and in, in mm -hmm. your podcast and, and the work that you're doing with your clients in a coaching sense, you have differentiated the terms survivor uh, from warrior, and you are using the term warrior. Tell us a little bit of the background of why uh, we often speak of cancer survivors, but you're changing our language a little bit here, which I love, by the way, is to engage cancer warriors. Yeah, for me, um, being a warrior is a much more empowering statement. You know, for me, survivor feels that it's something that's happening to you. You're just making do. You're just surviving through it. For me as a warrior, it's like you, you're going into battle, you know, you, know, you kind of know what your enemy is up to, but you're going to give it your best shot and you're just going to go in there and give it all you've got. Um, and I really believe that regardless of what stage you're at in your diagnosis or even in your treatment, you still have fight to do. And I, I truly believe it's, you know, we get to a point where we stabilize a little bit, but it's truly for the rest of your life. You, you can't ever go back. And, you know, sometimes you have episodes where you think of, oh my God, like, is my cancer back when you get like a little feeling here or there. But uh, I truly believe that to, to prosper and to really live fully, which is what I work with, you know, the most with my clients is like, okay, like this happened to you. Now let's get you beyond that. Um, you really need to have that positive warrior mindset to just keep moving forward. Well, right. And, and I, what I would ask of you is to explain to us how that affected your psychology going in, not necessarily as a victim, but going in with an yeah. intention. And, and there's, a, uh, there's a motive. And speak to the psychological side of that. Yeah. So I, I often state that when you're going through the motions of treatment, like they give you your plan. You just are kind of going through the motions, right? A lot of us, I would say, don't handle the emotional component until years later. I'm over three years out and I finally feel like I'm myself again. There's still some things I know I need to handle. However, um, you know, having that warrior mindset is that you are willing to take on whatever comes your way in whatever time and whatever method it shows up, right? Yeah. Um, you definitely need to be your own advocate advocate you need to educate yourself and you need to find a community you need to find support because this is something where some people try to do it alone and it's it's okay but i i would assert that at some point everybody needs support of somebody else and that's you, why I like have it be okay that you need help like it's part of your strength community yeah, can lift you yes absolutely and even someone with as much expertise or experience with it as you had. Tell us about your community there, just briefly, some of the key oh. people. Oh my goodness. So I was very blessed because, um, you know, more than half of my friends are in medicine. So everybody, I didn't have to explain it, right? Like that was one of my things. I, I was really quiet as to who I, want, I was talking about it because I was having a hard time dealing with it myself, that this happened to me, like I was the epitome of health. Um, but also I just could not handle everyone else's feelings, right? I needed to be strong for them because that's the role that I've always taken. So I was having a really hard time being strong for them and also still being strong for myself. So I mm. isolated myself a bit to a point that when I realized that I did it, I felt really bad. 
Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. I did, I heard a lot of people in the process and it wasn't intentional. It's just what I was going through. Sure. Sure. Well, that's understandable. Um, give us the highlights of your timetable for your treatment, just to bring everybody kind of, and, and there, there'll be many listening that have been through this, but what was your timetable and how did, how did things go from that, that diagnosis? Man, things moved really quickly for me. Um, my first phone call, even before, so because of my education and what I know, when I got my biopsies taken, I asked to see them because that's what I do every day. Mm. I purpose, I literally will look at patient samples and submit the best. If say we know that they want genomic studies, then I will make sure that that tissue that has the most amount of tumor gets treated a little bit differently than the rest, right? To make sure that they're able to get all the tests that they want. So of course, the first thing that I'm going to do is go and look at my own tissue. And I knew by looking at it that I had a problem. So my first phone call was to my boss who just happened to be like a world leading breast oncologist. Mm. And he's like, Lore, it's okay. It's probably nothing. And I'm like, no, like I know it's something. So I was very blessed in the fact that he took on getting all of my practitioners for me. He rallied my medical team um, and I'm forever grateful because it was one less thing I had to do. And I had complete faith in my team. Um, the other thing too that ended up happening was for me is that my tribe rallied and they had an Excel spreadsheet as to who's going to be covering me or what day, right? It was to the point that I had to tell them like, everybody stop showing up. Like I'm good. Yeah. <laughs> I'm good. My, yeah. Yeah. So my timeline was really, really quick. Um, within two and a half weeks of my diagnosis, I was already in surgery. Mm -hmm. And because I didn't have time to think about things, um, you know, the decision of, going and having reconstructive surgery with implants was like, okay, I guess I'm doing this, right? Like I didn't have a lot of time to think about it. The other question that they asked me that I was truly surprised about that I never really thought of was whether or not I wanted children. And up until this point, I haven't had kids, but now they're saying that I probably shouldn't after however my treatment goes and that I should, you know, save some eggs if it's something that I'm interested in. But for me, I had two and a half weeks to just sort all of that out. And then I was in surgery. I had a double mastectomy with reconstruction, um, but the reconstruction happened years later. And I was a stage two, somewhat um, aggressive. However, I did not have lymph node involvement. So I did not need chemotherapy or radiation. Mm -hmm. And honestly, when this whole thing started for me, that was what I prayed for. I'm like, universe, if you could let this go anyway, can you please just spare me of that? And mm. so I, I've been very, very blessed because I know so many people do not have that luxury. Yeah. Well, as you've come through it, can you tell us about the moment or the time frame, that, that instant where you decided that because of uh, the experience and, and what, you've, you know, what you've just come through, that you were going to make the decision? To, mm -hmm. to make an impact for other people who, in a way that's different from your job, of course. You were kind of working in it already, uh, but now that you had experienced it, tell us about that realization where you flipped the switch or something happened and you said, I know that I know that this is what I'm going to do uh, to make a difference. Yeah, so it happened once I went back to work. Um, and when I was back at work, I was still going in for my follow-ups. Um, and I realized in that moment how overwhelmed I was. So, you know, I was having treatment. I was getting seen in the hospital that I had worked in. So I knew where to park. I knew where the cafeteria was. I knew where the bathroom was. I knew where my doctor's office was. Like that whole stress of having to find where you need to be at what time, especially in a major academic center, which is where I got treated, is really overwhelming. And I realized if I'm overwhelmed and I know this place and I'm usually the one that gives people directions, how does everybody else do it? Like mm -hmm. it was, it's what I've lived. I've lived hospital for hospital settings for 20 years. So in that moment, when I realized, you know, that I was, I couldn't keep a thought, I was completely yeah, the best word to say is overwhelmed. I had, um, I realized that if I feel this way, other people need to feel this way and I have to make a difference for them. Wow. I have to help them. That's it. 
that it, that's beautiful. Um, and so you've started a coaching business. Tell me about that a little bit. Just to, what's the what's your vision? What's your mission in trying to come alongside people? So for me, I would I love working with people after they are done with their treatment. Like I said, you know, some of us have a treatment that goes very quickly. Some of us it's extended for a really long time. But what I truly believe is that at some point in time, you come to a point where you are just like, you know what? I'm done with feeling X, Y, and Z. I want more. And that's where I step in. I step in to be the, your cheerleader. I step in to be the, like, to see, to see and hear what you want for your life. And then I just support you through it. I hold your hand and we go through it. So my vision for my coaching is I most, I work mostly with women. However, I've never turned away, turned away a male client, but I work mostly with women to empower them in their next step, right? Like you've gone through the hardship and you've warriored through, and now it's time for you to, you know, take your life to the next step. Awesome. And, and in working with clients and folks that are in that situation, what would you say, you know, are the most common struggles that they face? Well, you've mentioned it a little bit, but just spin yeah. that out. Are you seeing some trends for folks? Uh, it may depend upon what, what particulars and circumstances, but are there some general things that, that your clients are struggling with? Absolutely. I think we all struggle with the emotional component. Um, I think we are... So many of us just want to forget about what happened and we just want to move forward that we forget to handle our hearts, handle our souls, like mm. have them heal. Um, because like I mentioned, going through treatment, is just more stuff that you need to do. So you have a plan, you have a list of appointments and you just keep going through the motions. The emotional stuff actually requires you to sit down for a second, be quiet, be still, and just be okay with what you've just gone through. And that's a really hard thing for people to do. So that's first and foremost, what we talk about, like, where are you at? What do you feel? Where do you want to go? And then the second is getting beyond the fear of recurrence, right? It's like, yeah. and there's a lot, there's also a lot of guilt, guilt for people that have helped you, whether it's your employer, whether it's your family, um, guilt in, in the fact that, you want to just live your life, but then you feel like you owe people so much for getting you to where you are. Um, and those are the top three that really, that we really work on a lot. Mm. I can imagine the physical part of this, especially for someone like you've, like you've mentioned and others that were, you know, came in pretty healthy and they were strong mm -hmm. and they didn't have, you know, maybe uh, pre-existing conditions and things like that. But the mm -hmm. physical part of it, as hard as that part of it is, might be the easier part, you know, because then you're dealing with more of the mental side of this, the fear, mm -hmm. uh, the emotional side. And those that I know that have been through this, you know, that that's certainly a part of the, the experience they have. Um, so in that sense, what tools are you using to kind of keep yourself, of course, healthy and, and positive? What are, what are you doing? What are some of the brief, you know, strategies, uh, if you would, that you would work with a person to try to keep them positive, keep them moving in the right direction? Mm -hmm. So, you know, great question. And, and I love what you said right before it. It's so true that physically you just go through the motions, right? Like it's something that you know you, you just need to do, you make it happen, or you choose not to make it happen, right? One or the other. Um, and emotionally, I think why it's different from the physical component is because you can't control it as much, right? It's a loss of control that you have that you feel a specific way and you don't want to feel a certain way, but you do. Um, so I think also what, you know, what people are trying to do is regain some form of control. And a lot of people do that by either closing themselves off, blocking out their emotions, um, you know, you name it, we all have our vices on how we do it. So one of the things that I, I work with with my clients is to look for the areas where they're holding on to control. Like where is control controlling your life for, a, better life, for yeah. a lack of a better word? And where are you able to just live free? And so we sort through that, we work through that. And, and we do that through, I'm a huge um, believer in journaling, mm. taking a journal, journal at least five minutes a day, whatever comes to mind, it doesn't need to be perfect. 
Um, I find that writing on paper is much more therapeutic than on a computer. So I tell people, get a pen, get a paper, like make it a fun ink, whatever you need to do. Um, and just write freehand for five to 10 minutes. And as long as you feel like you need to. And the other is gratitude. Mm. Um, what really got me through my journey and something that I share with everyone is I started a um, 365 days of gratitude. Yep. And it's something where I would literally count the days and I would go through my day and find something to be grateful for because there's always something to be grateful for. So I would take pictures of what would inspire me, what would I found something that was beautiful or unique. And at the end of the day, every day before I went to bed, I would write a post about it. And this is what my day was today. And this is what I was grateful for. And you know what? I feel that you could always find the negative and sometimes finding the positive is the hardest thing and staying in that positive vibe really brings you much more positive. Like you find your tribe, you find your people, you find where you need to be and what you need to do. And sometimes it's not, you know, it's never a straight road. So keeping yourself in alignment with who you want to be and who you are and who you want to surround yourself with is truly the key to having an amazing life after such a huge trauma. Absolutely. Yeah. And, <laughs> you know, that's good advice for all of us, regardless of whether we're cancer yeah. warriors or not. So, well, we all yeah. have our version, right? Yeah. So we've all had something. You know, you, you, um, we've mentioned it a lot, but by your academic preparation and your work experience, you had a, a, such a great, um, advantage, if I might call it that, to, mm -hmm. to now, having gone through it, um, I'm going to kind of highlight you as a superhero here by the <laughs> end, because you've gone through your pain. And that's, you know, it may seem cheesy, but I kind of want to, this is so, you know, an, an appropriate time with just this past weekend, the, the news of Chadwick Boseman's passing uh, from, um, colon cancer. And, and, you know, he played most recently the Black Panther, you know, character as a superhero. Uh, but Lori Marini, you are a superhero because uh, of what you've been through and the, the knowledge that you have. But coach us, if you would, coach me as, as a pastor, as a friend, as an encourager, in how we best, uh, as part of, to join the tribe of someone that we might know, what were some of those things that you might highlight for a person like me or those that are listening that might know someone uh, who is coming alongside a cancer warrior? How can we best help? I think first and foremost, just be there, right? Be there when they, when they need help, be there. Um, but be there in a way that have it be okay, no matter where they are. Like, don't try to fix it. Be there as a support. Um, Sometimes not saying anything is the best thing you can do, right? So, so many times people try to fix, fix you. And right now there's no fixing, like your chemo, your radiation, your, you know, naturopathic modalities, like they're going to fix you. Um, so what we really need is just to know that we are loved the way that we are, even with being disfigured or however, right? Um, and being loved for, you know, where we are right now, have it be okay with whatever it is that we're dealing with. Um, and just, if you want to be a support, just be a kind ear, but also offer something. Like, if you want to go grocery shopping for me, offer it. Don't, ask, don't wait for me to ask. Like, do the small little things that you know will make a difference. Um, whether it's, you know, folding the laundry, putting it away, like the little things that that, you know, it, it brings up a point that what surprised me the most was how, as a person who is fiercely independent, how I had to just give that up in order to have people support me. Mm. Yeah. Like and, and I, I would think that, that someone uh, from the outside may have to kind of work at that, be gracious mm -hmm. with you, be patient with you when you keep pushing me away to just say, okay, it's all right. Yes. I, I give you your space, but I'm here. And so, yeah, I think that's so helpful. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah. Um, 
Lori, give, give us a little sneak peek into your current work. You're working with a colleague on a, a, a book that will be released this fall. Uh, tell mm -hmm. us a little bit about that project. I love the title. I'll let you share that. But uh, tell us where this is coming from. So I had the honor of being on Tamara Look's podcast. Um, and from the podcast, she was inspired to invite me. And it's um, a collaboration on, on a book called Women Who Boss Up. And it's um, a healthcare edition. So it's women who boss up in healthcare. It's women who have faced adversity and found a positive outlook and a positive way to break free of that adversity, to overcome it. Um, so I'm very, very blessed that I was asked to be a part of this amazing um, initiative. And the book is launched is going to be launched in September. There will be some um, pre-ordering available that I will have on my website. I'll put the link up there too. Um, but it's really a amazing book of women who have just really overcome you know, health issues in their life and um, have found a way to just make a positive out of something so negative. Oh yeah. What a great work. So all the best Thank to you. you and she when, when you can release this and I'm sure there'll be other opportunities obviously and, and exposure for what you do. But I love that women who boss up, you know, <laughs> there's this warrior mentality. We're not going to be victims. We're going to take initiative and yeah. step into uh, what we're facing. So I would imagine a lot of the interviews and the stories uh, of these warriors come out of your own podcast. You are a host uh, like me. I appreciate that. And you host a, a podcast called Conversations with Courageous Cancer Warriors. Tell us where that came from and how that's going for you. So what I've learned throughout this journey is that everybody just wants to be heard, right? And my listening has changed because I'm no longer the same person I was. Um, and that's part why I chose to leave my pr profession. I absolutely loved, I wanted to make a difference in a different way, but still protect my soul. So I chose to um, be more of a consultant as a PA now than I am, and I've taken on coaching full time. I also am a speaker, so I do provide motivational speaking to groups. Um, and what the podcast has allowed me to do is really, have people ha share with the world what I'm hearing in a coaching session, right? But do it in a way that they get to share whatever they want to share, or however they want to share it. And I've had some, such amazing guests. Um, and it's, it's really something that I, I love and I hold true and dear to me because it's proven that we all have a same common thread. There's always something that you can get related to with someone. You just have to give them the time to open their heart. Mm -hmm. And so even though our journeys are all very different, I find that we all have a same common thread where we want to be good human beings. We want to encourage others by what we've been through of like, hey, maybe there's a better way for you. But ultimately we just all seek a community where you're just able to just be and not be judged and you know once you're on the other side certain things are just so difficult to hear like my girlfriends were so great and they were very supportive but probably like a month and a half two months after my double mastectomy they bought me a t-shirt that read my boobs tried to kill me mm -hmm. And before this, I probably would have laughed. When I got it, I actually started crying in private because sure. I didn't want them to see it. Yeah. But now I'm still not 100% convinced that I would laugh if I got it now. Right. Right. So there's, it's almost like a sensitivity training, <laughs> right, for yeah. people that yeah. as you go through this, just be kind and, and tread lightly because what might be something that someone else might find funny other people might actually no doubt be a little hurt by it yeah absolutely <laughs> uh, so that's that, what the, that's what the podcast has proven yeah and over that and over again. i would highly recommend it i've listened to several episodes and i just love your your um like you say your compassion your understanding in listening to another person's story what i it brought to my mind is that a burden shared 
is is actually only half as heavy, you know, and right. and so sharing it with someone like yourself who yeah. not only has the medical knowledge and sort of the, the you know the the intellectual uh, you know understanding of what what they've been through, you yourself have been through it and uh, are still going through it. It's it's you know you're once a warrior, always a warrior. I'm sure. So, um, Lori, this has been great. You are truly an inspiration. You are a superhero with a wonderful backstory now that you are using to make a, a positive impact in the world. You you qualify in every way as a true <laughs> encourager, and thank so you. thank you so much. How is it uh, that you would recommend that listeners best get in touch with you? Where can we learn more about you and and get in touch with you? So my website has all of my links to all my social media, my phone number, so you can actually get me on the phone, um, and uh, my email as well. So my uh, website is lorimarini.com. So that's L-O-R-I-M-A-R-I-N-I.com. Um, so please find me there. I'm also on Facebook. We have a, um, I have a Lori Marini coaching page on Facebook, and I also have a Lori Marini coaching on Instagram too. Awesome. Hey, the podcast, check it out, is Conversations with Courageous Cancer Warriors. And look for this upcoming wonderful book, Women Who Boss Up. Lori Marini, thank you so much once again for being on the podcast today. Thank you so much. It was really, really a pleasure to be here.